Hello, everyone. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. And on today's webinar, we'll be talking with Kasha Fusain, Solutions Marketing Ma Lead at Viavi Solutions, about best practices to locate RF interference sources with advanced interference hunting techniques. Uh, just a reminder, we've left some time at the end of today's webinar for any audience questions. If you have any questions, simply just submit those via the Q&A tab. Also, please note that a recording of this webinar will be sent to all registrants uh, within about an hour of today's webinar. At this time, I'd like to now hand the presentation over to Kashif to discuss advanced interference hunting techniques. Thank you, Kyle. Um, just like Kyle mentioned, so we will go over um, interference hunting uh, techniques. How do we hunt for interference? And there are three key steps in the hunting of interference. One is the detection of interference, then identification and location. I mean, a lot of time is spent in especially the last aspect of it, location of uh, interference, like where the source actually is located. And especially in cases when those are kind of hidden sources and are difficult to identify in a dense urban or urban environment. So we will talk about some of the advanced solutions that have come to the market recently, uh, which can significantly help in uh, basically location of those uh, RF interference sources. Okay, so um, we will go through a couple of few things, right? First, we will talk about what interference is, what kind of interferences are out there, what are the tools of interference that are available to uh, to the users. Then we will talk about the detection of interference and then sim uh, similarly identification location. And then we will have a summary and we'll close with questions. So next slide, I mean, in this one, um, basically, so what is interference? I mean, RF signal is all over the place. I mean, if you look at the top left hand side, top top right hand side, uh, as a 24 hour view of uh, RF spectrum from zero to three gigahertz, you can see that there is a lot of energy that is being available almost or being transmitted almost 24 hours a day. Um, and especially in the cellular spectrum, of course, there is signal available, uh, I mean, coming out or uh, transmitted in the TV, Wi-Fi, NAF, AM, FM bands as well. But you can see there is a constant transmission and all this energy that is being transmitted is can be a potential source of interference if there are some anomalies or the RF is not controlled or there are some mistakes that are made in the field. So what actually is interference? It is actually the unwanted energy I mean, because of a combination of emission, radiation, conduction, induction, and when that energy is received in a receiver, basically, and if it causes any kind of performance degradation or loss of information, so it can impact your capacity, it can impact your throughput, it can impact how a user sees the network or how they communicate on, in the network, whether it's a voice service or whether it's a data service. And if your signal to noise ratio is worse, then of course you will see those degradations. So that's the, that's basically the idea that when you have that kind of signal, which is impacting your receiver sensitivity or desensitizing your receiver, or in any way impacting the receiver, that's interference. Now, the one thing is uh, from an interference point of view, whether interference is um, basically a, is a forward link scenario or a, I mean basically a downlink scenario or an, or it's an uplink. Actually in, interference impacts both uplink and downlink. But there are certain uh, uh, reasons, one of the key reason is the limited power of the mobile device. A mobile device only transmits at around 200 milliwatts. Generally, in the actually in all the modern modern devices, they cannot transmit more than 200 milliwatts, which is 23 dBm. Now, for it uh, for it to close the loop to the uplink, that's the maximum it's allowed to. Now, imagine if your noise floor is going up, then in that case, the device will have a difficult time, right? And it is also causing interference not to the the, the users within that network, but also to the surrounding uh, cell sites as well. On the downlink, interference can be can have a similar impact as well, but there is, I mean, you see more impacts on the uplink when the user trying to close that link because of the limited power. On the downlink, you have up to 20 watts in some cases. Sometimes you can get a little bit higher than that, but 43 dBm is typically what you see. And uh, down below, you see the orange uh, traces indicating the interference and in depending on the type of the channel, right? So one is a much narrower channel of CDMA, versus the WCDMA channel and interference can impact significantly in all of these um, basically uh, technologies as well as LTE. 
Now, where does all of this start? So, so RF signal is generated whenever you are going to um, basically transmit, right? I mean, if, if from the very get-go, uh, the idea of modulation is to send that signal to a much further distance. So what you do, you actually uh, superimpose it on another signal and basically modulate it. When you do that, you also generate, uh, and any device will generate harmonics. And harmonics are usually the component, uh, frequency components, that, which are the integral multiples of the original signal. Right, and for when generally broadcasting transmitters are designed such that they minimize the emission of these harmonics. So they may be there, but they are either filtered out or they are at such a low power that they may not impact any other device around it. Right, but sometimes due to malfunction or device uh, inaccuracies or things like that, you may see some har some harmonics may be coming uh, really uh, too strong. So that can be one of the many reasons of interference just from the start, right? The other one we have heard a lot since the deployment of multi-carriers in, in the last 10, 15 years is PIM, passive intermodulation. So what is passive intermodulation? So just to give you an idea on the right-hand side, you see you have a WCDMA wideband channel and a GSM channel. When the two signals of different frequencies are applied to a non-linear circuit, then intermodulation products are generated. These are the sum and difference frequencies, right? So for example, as you can see in this case, a PIM can be generated at 846.8 megahertz, which is a sum and differ actually a difference product at a second harmonic of it. Uh, if you look at it, um, 869.2 and 891.6, and that can be a cause of interference on the uplink. Now, harmonic distortions are present and those multiples can further increase that. So what causes uh, passive intermods? Typically what we have seen, any issues with um, like the electrical joints, for example, if you have corroded uh, coax cables, you have connectors which are going bad. One of the examples uh, which I'm, I've shown on the right hand side, the rusty bolt effect, which acts as a diode actually, and that can also um, cause passive intermods. So any non-linearity in the overall circuit can generate passive intermods. Which, can, which is another source of interference and disruption or basically degradation of the RF network. In addition to that, you will see also see intentional radiators. One of the big problems that we have noticed is um, like the bi-directional amplifiers, right? When there is not enough isolation between the service antenna and the donor antenna. In some of the South Asian countries that we have also found out that uh, people are using their own small amplifiers to get signal into the building in urban environments. Unfortunately, those devices do not have, I would say, uh, enough isolation. As a result, they are also transmitting back into the, the network and causing a lot of interference. Uh, poor RF design, I mean, so it's not about all the RF energy anymore. It's not like, okay, the more RF's uh, number of bars I'm seeing, the better my signal is. Yes, your RSSI is better, but if not controlled properly, if your overlaps are not controlled, then in that case, you are basically you will see uh, those that, that RF energy being a source of interference for other users. Remember, you have a receiver sensitivity. If the noise flow goes above the receiver sensitivity, you are, de you are desensitizing the receiver in that sense. So basically, now the the transmit device have to transmit at a much higher power to cross that noise flow boundary and to become a signal which can be understood and demodulated. Uh, the other thing that we noticed, and especially that was very prevalent uh, when we are deploying um, uh, the 4G network, uh, a lot of use cases came out was were related to improper spectrum clearing. So for example, there was some 2G, uh, so basically GSM cell sites that were transmitting in. So those things that we need to be, uh, to take care of. Now, the other, Question, uh, other thing that uh, is, so what are the practical implications? I mean, so what does that really mean? Interference is there, so how does it really impact? Now, just to give you an idea of an LTE signal, right? So we have heard about the different modulation schemes. We also understand that there is a BTS scheduler, a base station scheduler sitting, which decides actually what kind of modulation schemes will be used. In addition to, for example, the amount of data sitting there, the QoS, this channel quality indicator is another key matrix that is used as part of the scheduler. So basically, the scheduler is also looking at the RF environment, and then it is deciding 
whether I should assign a QPSK type modulation scheme, a 16 QAM or a 64 QAM. 16 for 64 QAM being the most efficient and gives you the highest throughput. So meaning if I have a lot of data sitting in my, I'm downloading a big file or something like that and a lot of data for me, then in that case, if I'm in an excellent RF environment, I can quickly get my data and can be out of the network which means the capacity now is available for other users. I mean, consider as a, as a pooling efficiency. Now, at the same time, if I am in a poor RF environment, that it'll, it's going to take a lot of time for the base station to send me that data because I'm on a lower modulation scheme. So that's one of the implications. And if you look at it from a bandwidth reduction, if going to a 16 QAM versus a 64 QAM, it's a 33% degradation. So if you look from a service provider perspective, for any reason, if my RF environment is poor, I'm losing money on the table. I'm, I'm not using my network uh, resources to the full extent. Same thing goes if my RF environment goes poor. So I'm not just causing a QoS problem for the users. I'm also creating a, a basically a cost, uh, I mean, an OPEX and CAPEX problem as well. That's why RF environment and RF interference is such a key thing to be looked at. Another way to look at this, so if you think about it, you have um, 180 kilohertz, um, I mean, resource block. If they have only one resource block impacted, let's say if there is interference. So uh, as we know, LTE is much more robust compared to other wideband signals. Now in that case, you will lose about 4% in a five megahertz channel. If you have multiple resource blocks, say seven of them, then you can impact up to 28% of your lose 28% of your capacity in that case. So this is just a rough measure. So what can we do about it? One thing before we talk about what can we do about it. So based on um, a lot of data collected over a period of three years and talking to a lot of cell technicians and stuff, anecdotally, anecdotally we can say a lot of issues related to the performance of the base station are usually uh, present at the base station itself. So some of them can be, for example, like 36% we noticed uh, were around loose or dirty bad connectors so related to connectors. 34% uh, were related to jumper, whether the jumper was basically kinked or there was something wrong with the jumper and that uh, those kind of scenarios. So arresters or passive devices that are uh, basically added to the, to the cell site or, uh, for multiplexing and demultiplexing reasons and what have you. Uh, Sometimes antenna were the cause of the problem. So, I'll, I'm, and of course, there is a outside interference as well. I'm not saying that interference is not there. Interference is there, but most of the problems are related to the cell site. In fact, some of the hygiene related to the cell site, if not um, looked at it properly, they can again create PIM problems as well. So that's one of the one of the more important sites, one of the more 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 important reasons to ensure that the hygiene of the cell site is in perfect condition. Other things that we should look at from uh, from a best practices point of view, proper system RF planning for so whether you're doing a frequency PCI PSC, and or even the RF footprint overlap. We need to have optimized RF footprint overlap. You cannot have a hole, but at the same time, it should not be so much that it is causing interference. Uh, of course, controlling sources of local radiation causing interference, like it can be any source. Sometimes, I mean, a store opened up and they may be having some sort of a device that is transmitting because we have found cases like that. So we have to identify those type of events as well. But those are far in between. But I mean, we need to look for those as well. Of course, um, the thing I already talked about, the proper installation techniques, like uh, the cabling, connectors, adapters, active and passive components, uh, using the right torque wrenches, make sure that the torque is correct, uh, I mean, correct, and uh, connecting the two ends of the connector properly. Antenna selections and uh, placement of the antenna. I mean, uh, an antenna at the top of the tower versus the edge of the, the um, uh, edge of a building, they do act differently because how the side lobes act and how the main lobes get back, I mean, basically hit the walls and all that stuff. So all those things need to be considered designed properly. And one thing that we have noticed that some of the tier one operators in the US, they do a, a, a lot of proactive sweep tests to ensure that um, basically the cable and antenna system is uh, actually designed properly and working as it should be. It's one of the key things. Otherwise, again, going back to the, the original argument, you are basically not utilizing your resources properly 
if you are you have any any type of network uh, issue that is created by the quality of the cell site going to the next slide so what are the tools of interference so some of the key tools um, that you may have seen i mean yes you have heard about a spectrum analyzers and all that stuff but i mean the way the interference story starts is usually that you will uh, see something in your KPIs and ONMs, right? You will realize that some sort of uh, issue has been created either at a site or in a nearby area of a site, right? And also typically you also get subscriber feedback as well. If they are, it's suddenly they started getting poor performance, right? So something may have happened in that RF environment. Uh, system alarms, um, for example, the RX0, RX1 alarms that you have seen, and of course, uh, taking a spectrum analyzer out there and then you are troubleshooting interference reasons and interference causing use along with a Yagi antenna or a directional antenna, uh, even an omni antenna in some cases, right? Um, scanners or receivers doing drive testing and you realize suddenly that my mobile transmit power is suddenly gone up. I mean, mobile should be transmitting it, but, but there is always a power, uh, I mean, power control loop that goes on. But if the mobile is constantly transmitting power at high, it means there is something wrong in the network i mean and then finally you can there are the more in in some of the newer solutions that are coming to the market which are related to interference location tools and we will talk about that uh, and one of the key new features or our solution actually um, we have introduced as well along the same lines which can help uh, users to quickly identify um, interference uh, sources uh, actually locate interference for them so now let's get back into the spectrum side analyzer piece of it to locate and detect and uh, I, I mean basically I, I, I mean uh, identify interference. So a spectrum analyzer is the one of the most important tools that is used. There are multiple companies making a spectrum analyzer but there are a couple of features they always have within the, within the spectrum analyzer to troubleshoot in, uh, interference. Features like interference and analyzers along with the spectrum analyzer, right? Um, so using an omni or a directional antenna, it can be used to identify the sources of interference. Some spectrum analyzers actually have additional software to help autonomously identify interference sources. A spectrogram is also, which is also like a spectral waterfall, so it is very useful um, uh, tool uh, in identifying interference problems, especially when it's an intermittent signal. And if it, is, if it is drifting in frequencies because of some device failure or whatnot, then it is very useful to see how the interference moves are, is moving in the frequency or time space. Um, so typical process of interference hunting, usually it's an unhappy customer um, making a call and basically not very happy on how the network is performing or an engineer identifying a KPI anomaly. Now from that point on, the, the step uh, of detection happens, right? Where the idea is to try to uh, narrow down where this problem may be. So, and also to identify the probable uh, RCA. I mean, a simple root cause could be a, a hardware failure. That's not an interference problem. That's just a hardware, hardware failure. And we can always go and troubleshoot that. That the challenge is when it is an interference, when you're looking at your KPIs, you're looking at the alarms, alarms look okay. Everything comes out to be fine. So what's my next step? Okay, so then I go out for a drive. I mean, so then you go in the field and try to identify what is going on in that area. So then you start looking for things like, okay, is my mobile transmit power too high? How's my C2I, my, how my, uh, I mean, signal to noise ratio and all those things. And then you try to, build actually you're kind of peeling an onion and trying to uh, go into uh, the next level where you're trying to identify what is the root cause once you identify that okay yes it, it's potentially uh, interference related problem then you may have to run some tests at the site to identify what kind of interference it is is it some sort of a cellular band interference that is causing it or it is something an external source or maybe it's an internal like a pim what got generated some 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 hardware may have uh, created this kind of a, a situation in there right so then uh, from that point on if it's a pim or something in the cellular band it's much easier to troubleshoot but if it is an external source it just suddenly started right then in that case you will have to go and locate that source and and maybe uh, work with that um, the i mean that i would say the transgressor or the basically the source that is uh, uh, shooting all the signal into your network and um, to ask them to turn it down basically. 
because they are doing that because that's an illegal operation in that case. However, the challenge with all, the whole thing is you need experience resources and there's a significant amount of time required to locate interference. And that's where we'll talk about our autonomous solution, which can significantly reduce the time uh, to locate interference. And you don't need too many high ex I mean, experience resources. A single engineer with uh, decent training can easily perform that activity. Okay, so now, now going into the detection phase of it, but before we go into the detection phase, I want to spend some time to uh, get an understanding of the basic um, noise floor, what that means, what does the sensitivity of a product really means, and how does frequency play a role in uh, basically your um, power calculation. So, I mean, we are all aware of this equation, the noise uh, floor equation. Uh, so if you, if you look at it this way, right? So your Boltzmann constant, which is K and temperature usually is constant. So the noise, the, the, the power is basically directly proportional to the bandwidth. And if you look at on the left-hand side, as you double your bandwidth, your power goes up by three dB. And if you look at the, the second part of the slide, your noise power is, uh, which is, which is basically your noise floor is present for different technologies and it's at a different level. So your signal has to come at least is stronger than that value. Now assuming if there is interference added into the system, this noise value becomes much worse. Now your signal has to come much stronger than that to the radio so that it can basically um, be demodulated at the, at the base station. So the point here is wider bandwidth signals contain more power than narrower bandwidth signals. And uh, the other thing is that when you are measuring power, it is essential to understand the time and frequency implications of that. So uh, some of the key things that we should understand in a spectrum analyzer when we are trying to detect for in interference, there are the to, uh, to basically be efficient, we need to understand the relationship of these factors and parameters and how we use the spectrum analyzer properly uh, before we go out and hunt for interference. Remember the interference signals are usually very weak signals. For, for us to make sure that um, these signals are seen correctly, we need to ensure that our attenuation, our PD amplifier setting, and our resolution bandwidth is properly adjusted. On top of these three parameters, there's a trace management. Trace, I'll talk about it in a couple of slides, why trace management is so important, because that's how you can identify the, the aggressor signal, as well as uh, the frequency span can, ident can help you in identifying the time it takes to basically run the, the trace completely, right? So, I mean, um, the idea is as, uh, um, so if you, I mean, I can simply look at the, the slide and the, you can see the top signal where you have an attenuation of 10 dB and the preamplifier is off and the resolution bandwidth is set to 300 kilohertz. You can see what my DANL, which is the displayed average noise level, so what, what my ability to see on the screen of the spectrum analyzer, right, is quite, um, quite uh, poor in that sense because I want to see the lower end signals who are coming in at a much lower value. For example, something coming at NEC1 or NEC110 or NEC108, I want to see them or maybe NEC99 or something. So if I have that uh, setting attenuation in there and the preamplifier is not there and my resolution bandwidth, then I won't be able to see that. But if I correctly uh, reduce the attenuation value so that the lower level signals can be can come in and with, by, by adding the preamplifier, basically turning it on and, res and reducing the resolution, uh, I mean bandwidth, I can now see those lower, uh, uh, lower signals. So just wanted to share that relationship and that's the reason they're very important to understand when you're running a spectrum analyzer. At the lower end, you can see that how, uh, I mean, the, the granularity of the signal. So with a one, one megahertz resolution bandwidth, the trace, uh, the, how the shape of the trace would be versus when you have a one kilohertz. Of course, there is a trade-off. The trade-off is the sweep speed. So, I mean, the idea is that you should have a decent sweep speed, but at the same time, you should be able to see, um, I mean, the, the details of the interference signal as well. Uh, next slide. So here, here is an example, um, just to show you, um, if you want to, again, if you want to improve the sensitivity of the spectrum analyzer, you will have to reduce your attenuation, um, or basically eliminate in some cases, you will have to reduce your resolution bandwidth, right? And also you will have to ensure that your amplifier is on. 
So if you look at the orange line, the orange line by itself, if you look at uh, on the WCDMA uh, signal, uh, are with a resolution bandwidth of 300 kilohertz, you don't see any interference. It looks like an average signal. However, when you take the resolution bandwidth down to 10 kilohertz, you can see that basically um, you, there are certain spikes that are coming in now into that signal. So that basically gives you the granularity to detect um, the, the, the basically the interfering signal in this case. Uh, next uh, slide, how, how, how do you detect what kind of a signal? So there are a couple of steps in that. Uh, here I'm just gonna uh, talk about uh, the trace aspect of it. So using a trace, uh, basically min and hold, min hold and max hold uh, function. So if you look at the orange, again, the orange signal, and if you focus on that, it doesn't, the interference does not come out very clearly, but because it's this, you're looking at an up, uplink, uh, uplink signal, so which is not a constant signal, basically it is uh, coming at different time frames. that in that case, if you look at the maximum hold, you can see uh, uh, the trace shows somewhat of a 200 kilohertz GSM type signal in this scenario, right? However, the min hold shows where the noise floor should be. So you can now detect that yeah, there is some sort of an interference. It looks like a GSM signal. And then we can do further analysis. Uh, basically we can run a basically signal analyzer to identify what kind of a signal it is. And we'll talk about it in a minute and how it is impacting uh, the interference in that case, right? Some of the other key things that we should look in a spectrum analyzer. I mean, if you're looking at a TDD, time division multiplex, then basically the gated sweep feature which can help you identify interference sources uh, on the uplink. Remember, you're sharing the frequency, your gated sweep allows you to look at those transmission uh, slots where you are listening to the uplink only. Uh, same thing for, uh, for RF over SIPRI type analysis. As you know, in modern, um, I mean, modern telecommunication or, or basically in the modern base stations, now you have a remote radio at the top of the tower and you have a baseband unit at the base of the tower. Right, and, uh, and along same thing goes for, I mean, you can see a DAS is as well. The DAS is the same concept where you have a, a hub end and then you have remote radios located close to the, basically to the, uh, to the antennas, which are then connected through a, through a coax cable to the antenna. Although there is a fiber going in between, and of course there is no PIM or anything in the fiber that you can see because it's all digital connection. However, you can still see if there is a, on the coax lines, if you see any problems there, you can identify any sources of PIM, not just in the antennas, but or, I mean, or the coax lines, but also if there is a challenge, if there is a problem with the remote radios as well. So RF over SIPRI, if, that, if the spectrum analyzer supports RF over SIPRI uh, analysis, then you can also look for um, internal PIM issues. You can also identify external interferences through basically um, RF over SIPRI chain that goes between the baseband unit and the radio unit. Another example of that, I mean, if you have a, want to see the MIMO diversity or if there is a problem between the two antennas, you can also do an analysis based on that RF over uh, SIPRI. The use, reason I use RF over fiber because there are two different standards. One is the OPS standard and one is the SIPRI standard. Uh, some spectrum analyzers, um, offer both solutions. They support both OPSI as well as SIPRI. So, I mean, you can just switch them, switch between them and do that analysis. And and, and this is just another view of uh, if you, uh, yeah, the spectrogram. So spectrogram truly helps you, especially in cases of uh, comparing to, uh, to different antennas as well as comparing uh, different times and frequencies. So that's a very useful tool in that case. Now we were talking about the detection of it. Now, if you now let's go to the identification aspect of it. Now, to identify, uh, if you can run, there are certain tests uh, actually modules that are already in a spectrum analyzer and that you can run. Like in this case, if uh, you look at it, your your um, the identifier will Id uh, tell you that it's a GSM signal, and the for uh, the channel is 130 on the forward link that is coming in. Uh, on, for this WCDMA signal. So basically, I mean, if you are um, running an interference analysis analyzer, then in that case, you can identify the source of interference, especially if it's in the cellular spectrum. 
so going into the next slide, the signal analysis can literally tell you actually where the signal is coming from. For example, in this case, it can tell you site 60, site 36 was the transgressor and that's where the signal is coming from because it can do the demodulation and it is impacting site 267 WCDMA. So that's basically makes the makes, makes life easier in that case. Um, the next um, aspect of it is the location, which is very tricky and um, takes a lot of time and especially in traditional testing. So traditionally what um, users do once they identify that there is a external interference let's call it uh, some some transmitter that is uh, not behaving the way it should be maybe there's a filter failure or maybe a bi-directional am amplifier that is not transmitting the right way and you have identified that this, there is a source of interference in the neighborhood then what you do you take your spectrum analyzer with a directional an uh, antenna basically I call it as a directional receiver and you start measuring that signal now the idea is uh, with the ability of uh, the mapping function in the spectrum analyzer, uh, along with um, the, the RF analysis that it can perform and the GPS coordinate uh, information because it has also uh, has a GPS, info, it also records the GPS information. You can basically, basically literally move your antenna around and see where the strong signals are coming from and you can draw um, basically, um, I would say uh, the, the, the straight lines to the source. And by doing it at three different locations, yeah, a, a small green circle is formed on the spectrum analyzer in this case, and it shows you a, a smaller radius for, for locating the interference. This is a, a, a very difficult uh, process because it takes a lot of time. You have to be very careful. You have to look at it from uh, places where there is uh, not a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, multipath because if it's, an, um, if it's a dense urban environment, then it will be very difficult. You'll have to go to a much higher height so that you can avoid the multipath and whatnot. And um, basically, um, this is a little bit of a challenging solution. So, I mean, like I said, if it is truly an, uh, an urban environment and there's a lot of antennas and buildings where the system, I mean, where the signal is getting reflected and you have a lot of multipath, then what do you do? I mean, then basically, how do you pinpoint the interference sources? So then in that case, um, what happens, you spend a lot of hours and a lot of resources. To overcome that, uh, there are autonomous interference solutions as well. So one autonomous solution that we know is an interference advisor that um, we, we, we has come up with um, um, very recently. It actually walks, uh, you can just put this solution basically a spectrum analyzer with an, with an antenna um, and um, basically um, a software solution of our eagle eye solution sitting on a tablet, which connects to the spectrum analyzer through basically Wi-Fi. And what Eagle Eye does, it actually, you can control the spectrum analyzer so you don't have to go back and forth between the spectrum analyzer to change any of the spectrum uh, measurements or anything like that, like the resolution bandwidth or the span, what have you. You can do all of that from, uh, from, the, from, the, from the tablet. And it's cable free, so it's very easy. Basically, you can literally take the box, uh, literally take the spectrum analyzer out when you are very close to it and connect an antenna and shoot it at the interference source if you want to locate it. So, but as you keep, what the solution actually does as you keep driving around, um, it, it helps you get close to the interference source and it keeps on building the database of the RF resources and keeps on demodulating the more and more signal and it gets you close to the interference source. Uh, that's uh, pretty much um, it. So in summary, RF interference is a, uh, I mean, a, uh, I mean, a phenomena which is continue, which continues to become more and more challenging with the deployment of more and more, uh, I would say, devices and and getting as more and more spectrum is getting used. I mean, originally when we started uh, 20 years ago, there was only one 800 megahertz spectrum or 850, and then we started to see 1900. Then we had uh, the AWS, now the 700, and um, I mean, not to forget that two and a half gig, and now you have the basically unlicensed spectrums will be coming as well, which is of course at a much higher uh, spectrum uh, and much closer cell sites in that scenario. But you have a 600 spectrum that is also coming out. So when all of this transmission is going on and any of the devices, if they fail and they can cause any, uh, I mean, I mean uh, RF to come into another uh, radio spectrum, I would say, I would say uh, basically another band, then it can cause some sort of an interference. So we have to find solutions which are more automated and which are more uh, unattended so that uh, resources, time, and energy is less spent on these things. And of course, in order for doing a proper detection, 
we need the right set of tools uh, so that a proper uh, the maintenance time can be reduced and basically you can offer um, best network network coverage and capacity so that's all i have um, any questions kyle yeah, thanks, Kashif. That was a great presentation. Uh, we had a, a few questions come in, and if anyone has any further questions, please just submit them through the control panel, and we should be able to get to those. So first question coming in, how do autonomous interference hunting solutions work, and how does it exactly save time? Yeah, so I'll give you a use case. So we were doing some testing in Southeast Asia. Um, and the picture actually you saw what actually a true picture of where we were doing the testing and um, basically so on eBay uh, of some a person just bought a device so that they can shoot uh, I mean they can basically cover their building unfortunately that device uh, caused a lot of interference in that neighborhood now once detected that there is interference in that neighborhood I mean the handheld solutions were not working well because now you have to walk around and every day it seemed like we are in we are we can locate that place we were not able to because you were going from one place to another and what have you right i mean every day it looked the signal bouncing back and forth so what we did i mean the operator in that case uh, reached out and we said okay let's try our um the uh, I mean, an automated solution. So what it does, it actually builds kind of, if the more and more roads you drive, it actually, the internal algorithm, of course, which I cannot share the algorithm, but it actually captures the, the received uh, data from the interference source and basically start demodulating. And it, because of the differences, what it sees, it just starts trying to kind of uh, pinpointing from a triangulation point of view where this source might be. And as a result, it took us very close to this building and we saw a couple of antennas uh, hanging off that building. So basically that way it significantly reduced the time it took them like three to four days by walking the streets and identifying and still they failed. They were able to do it in like hours using our solution in that case. So it significantly reduces your drive time, uh, sorry, your uh, interference location time. All right, Kash, if we had uh, someone asked about a uh, specific Viavi products that actually deal with autonomous interference. Yeah, so it's uh, the solution's name is Interference Advisor. And um, it basically it's a spectrum analyzer along with the antenna and a tablet, which has um, basically our Eagle Eye software running on it. So the two combined product is called the Interference Advisor. Okay, great, thanks. So we had a, a couple of questions come in relating around PIM. So why do we see PIM problems in DAS when fiber is used? Uh, that's a very good question. If you think about it, um, the whole pur purpose of getting to fiber, I mean, of course, to extend the signal and everything, but it also eliminates because you don't have coax. So the it's, everything is done in the digital domains. I shouldn't. However, what we are noticing that PIM can also be generated by some of the active components as well. For example, a remote radio has some issues with it. It can cause PIM issues as well. And actually we did, uh, we were able to find some sort of PIM issues like this in US um, for some of the tier one operators that way, where the radio was the offender. And even the coax cable that is used beyond the radio and the antenna, they can, they can also cause uh, PIM, PIM issues as well. So although fiber uh, kind of el eliminates that, but it's still you are using coax components and uh, other devices that can cause uh, PIM issues. Okay, and uh, next kind of PIM related question. So if someone has a rusty shaft in their, their place, let's say on top of a roof that is about 20 feet high, um, in front of the antenna, um, can, be, can that be the cause of external PIM if you only have one frequency band signal? at the site or do you need to have um, differing bands at the site to ha to cause PIM? Right, that's a good question. Uh, basically for a PIM to generate, you need at least two or uh, two or more different signals to be present because it's always, it's because usually what happens that you, one signal will always have its own filter and everything, but the combination of the two signals, that's why if you remember back in the day when we only had one carrier, we never needed uh, any PIM testing or anything like that. But with the introduction of multiple carriers, and when we, we, are, we were transmitting, let's say 800 and 1900 together, and then as we can continue with AWS and what have you, and we, we were using, uh, of course, the similar uh, cables and what have you, then in that case, guess what? 
when you have multiple bands uh, signals being transmitted those combinations and their 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 products and as well as their uh, i think there are some indifference products basically they they cause interference okay so next question coming in uh, back to the automated solution uh, you talked about uh, how many bearings can it measure to isolate the source and how many bearings um, does it have i i think i'll have to take that question for to my design team to get back sorry kyle so okay no worries um, so next one coming in. So what is the best way to measure a high, in a high density of transmitters environment? High density of transmitter environments? Uh, you mean uh, interference? Um, so yeah. I'm going to assume it's uh, the question is related to interference in this case, right? Uh, so I mean, technically, if every transmitter is behaving the way it should be, for example, I mean, you can have, like I said, you can have multiple transmitters, like at different bands, right? Everything should work fine. It is always when there is a, a problem because you have filters on the transmit side as well, right? And of course, on the receive band, they should not, the signal should not be coming in. I mean, in an in an in typical FDD type environment, when you look at it, where, where you have an upper band and lower band, they're already separated out and the signal should not be coming in. However, if because of certain anomalies that have been created because of, let's say, um, some, some sort of a PIM situation that has been created or a device that has failed. For example, we talked about the, the bi-directional amplifier in that case, right? Or somebody who is sending uh, un unknown signals or illegal transmission. For example, uh, when people have uh, certain Wi-Fi devices uh, uh, hitting some other signals, what have you, only then you should see interference problems. Doesn't matter if you have four or five different frequencies used at a base station in one location. Only if there is a problem the way they are conducted. Remember the best practices slide I talked about? As long as we have proper filtering, we have the proper uh, site maintenance activities going on, all of this should work fine and you should not have any reason for interference. In situation where there is a failure in any of the components or if the, the site hygiene, meaning the connectors had a problem, you had issues with the cell site itself, you have a jumper which was kinked or there's a bullet hole in the cable or the antenna was bad, only in those situations, these transmission bodies can impact and create other products as well. Okay, uh, we had a couple questions referring to LTE uplink. So, is there any way to quickly locate and identify LTE uplink interference? Quickly, <laughs> uh, that's a very loaded question. It's it's very it's very much similar. You will see that the whole technique is very much similar the way you do interference hunting anyway. It will always be, uh, so, so now we are talking about the detection aspect of it. First, you have to identify where the, whether it is even an interference or not, or not, right? Because when you start testing, the first thing you look at is your KPIs, you look at your alarms. You, the first step is to look at the alarms. Is there anything wrong with the cell site? Because you don't get a, a, any interference kind of alarm. All you get is uh, there is a problem with the cell site either the customer is unhappy or you are seeing KPI anomalies where you are, let's say your target was to have 0.8 drop calls and 0.9 a fail connection attempts or basically or availability or retainability we are talking about, right? And, and then your throughput, if those, those parameters are not within the bounds, then the next step is, is you start looking at your KPIs and then starting from your KPIs and the, the logs that are collected at your O&M system, right, basically, then you go and look at that and try to analyze if there are any problems within those logs. And it's kind of peeling an onion, like I said before, right? So it's a multi-step process. You have to go through identifying if there is a, really an interference problem or not. Once you realize that there is a, a localized site-related problem or a few sites, a few sectors involved uh, in, in, in that area, then you go to the cell site and then from there you, you try to identify. For example, one of the key things that it is an uplink interference is you look at your drive test log for mobile transmit power. I mean, or it, in some cases, I mean, you will see a very clear indication. If, even if it's not drive, if you're collecting some data from some remote tools, uh, you can also see what is going on there. So you don't have to drive, but you can actually look at data from there. If that data is available, then basically you can identify why my mobile is transmitting at such a high power because you, when you designed your network, your link budget should be sufficient enough that you should not have a significant amount of high transmit power all the time. 
And that's where you say, okay, if my mobile is transmitting, it means there's something wrong with the uplink. Irrespective of the technology, LTE, WCDMA, CDMA, interference will show similar type of characteristics and will be a similar method of troubleshooting. All right, that was great. Um, so the next question coming up. So why is inter interference so high at the cell edge in LTE? I mean, one of the key reasons uh, is, um, is because of the significant overlap that we, we see that, see, traditionally people have always considered, oh, my, so more signal bars are excellent. Um, LTE, not so much, because you are sharing the same resource blocks. I mean, same, it's a frequency reuse of one. Now, basically, if you look at it from an OFDMA perspective, even for that matter, you are in cell one versus cell two, sharing, sharing the same resource block. If both of them have you know, a significant overlap at the border, guess what's going to happen? The other signal is a source of interference. So in CDMA, where you truly take advantage of soft handoff and your neighborless allow you on all that stuff, and you have a significant overlap, that's fine because you basically are connected at one point to two base stations in CDMA. Meaning you have, a, when you say soft handoff or softer handoff, then you actually have the receiving uh, voice connection from both the sides, right? Not so much in EVDO, not so much in, in basically the data type technologies like LTE, where you are talking to one base station or your get, data is getting modulated from one and then you hand off to the other one. So that's why your OLAP needs to be minimized so that you can have less uh, interference that is created at the edges. Okay, um, so going back to the automated solution, can that find external interference if the interferer itself is not fixed in frequency and power? Yeah, that's why we you know, we talked about the spectrogram as well, right? And it, sometimes it, they are drifting. Actually, uh, one use case I have that we did some testing in uh, in uh, South America, in actually Mexico, and what we found out that some there was something wrong with the with the device that was um, located. There were like ten different antennas sitting on that uh, on top of a building, and it was kind of bouncing between multiple frequencies. So we are seeing. Uh, interference coming up in one and the other one. But with the help of a spectrogram, we were able to see that, yeah, this is the same source, which is just moving in time. So using a spectrogram of waterfall can significantly help you in that regard. Okay, uh, next one coming in. So what is the quickest way to identify if a source is PIM or interference? Quickest way to identify it's a PIM. Running a PIM test is um, basically, um, so if you, you can do a PIM detection test. Go to the cell site, connect ju just the picture that I showed in the TE connectivity web page that I had. You connect it there, you turn it on, you can very quickly, within minutes, you can identify a PIM using a PIM detection tool like a spectrum analyzer. That, that doesn't take that long actually. It's a very quick identification of PIM. You will see the signature of PIM that well, one will be quite off from the other one and whatnot because if it's a PIM, then it will be impacting one of the cable, one of the antenna lines, it won't be impacting everything else because there is something internal going on or, or if it's the radio one, you will see related to that radio. Because if it's an interference around the network, then you will see it impacting all the cell sites, all the sectors in that. If you're seeing it one place, then if you're seeing other PCIs or something like that, you will see that impact there as well. Okay, uh, next question. So what are some tools and techniques in order to uh, track intermittent, intermittent inter interference? So if there is a consistent interference, how do you track intermittent? And that's what I just talked about. Using a spectrum analyzer, you can identify intermittent interference and using a spectrogram or a function of a spectrum analyzer. Okay, great. Um, so with all the active PCIs in an LT network, uh, which one are you actually displaying and how do you distinguish one from another? Yeah, that's why you are in the, which, is, which coverage area you are in. I mean, remember the first thing we said, you have to localize your problem. So once you have identified that I should be in sector X or sector Y or sector Z, this is my PCI should be. Because I mean, again, going into the steps of uh, hunting, right? Once I have defined my, my network and I've identified the problem is at sector A or B or C, then I know which should be my source one in that area versus what else I'm seeing around it. All right. So one person is asking here, so earlier you referred to 97% of interference is internal to the network. Can you go into that a little bit more and what some of those sources may be? No, actually I didn't say 97% of the ah. interference. What I said that the performance issues 
the performance issues overall, almost 97% of the time they're internal to the cell site, meaning hygiene of the cell site. So it's, um, it's interference is one aspect of it, but the connectors, for example, you can still have interference. You can talk about PIM, right? Passive intermodulation. That can be caused if you have dirty connection, broken, broken connection or something. If you created a non-linear uh, circuit for the cell site and you are injecting multiple signals into that non-linear circuit, then you will get an interference, but it'll be a passive intermod. And we, we talked about that, right? Now, uh, that's, the, that's the point. And if you have antenna problems, that's not a cause of interference, but that is cause of your performance degradation. So, so because the, like I said, you do not get a call that I have an interference problem. A user never says that. They will always complain about my performance, my network, so I'm, I'm not getting my throughput. I'm not basically getting my voice calls done and all that stuff. So, that, so that's how the sequence of events work, right? And basically now when we talk about the outside interference, this is typically when somebody is externally injecting a signal into you, which it's, it's rare from uh, overall performance scenarios that we talked about. All right, looks like we have time for a couple more questions here. So the next one we had, so uh, what are some good spectrum signature or profile to detect uplink LTE interference? Mm, I'm, I'm not sure about the question. Good profile? Uh, does the question, does that mean like uh, how the signal should look at? So in, in that case, what I would do, go to an, any healthy site. Actually, we do recommend that because sometimes it is very difficult to identify problems in a site. So go to any healthy site or site location, turn on your spectrum analyzer and when you run that, and if you hold a maximum hold on your uplink, you will see how your curve should be or how your trace should run. Now, my, the point is, if if you're uh, if you are in a poor area, you can truly see when you run the max hold and the min hold, you will see the different signatures and how if a signal is where the noise flow should be, and where the max should be, they are coming out to be, and that's how you can capture basically your um, your different differences in traces can tell you if there is a problem or not. But if you want a healthy one, then you should go in an area where you know the RF performance is good so that you have a good baseline for that. Okay, great. And that looks to be about all the time we have. I wanna thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Headache Free Interference Hunting, presented by Viavi Solutions. Again, our presenter today was Kasha Hussein, Solutions Marketing Lead at Viavi Solutions. Thank you, Kasha. Thank you all, I appreciate it.